thank you all for providing a fascinating in uh, insights. Uh, it's such a privilege to hear actually from the inside, to hear about policy recommendations, to get the stereotypes uh, challenging the essentialist assumption on gender and the historical accounts. Uh, but I would like to go out first uh, to ask the Minister for Foreign Affairs Wallström about actually picking up on what uh, Anne was saying in the end of her lecture, the polarization that we see presently uh, and the challenges uh, in the international arena for multilateral institutions such as diplomacy, where now Sweden is in the Security Council. So what do you perceive as being the major sort of challenges but also opportunities in the Security Council. Sweden has now two years to actually uh, trying to push some of these great concerns on, on gender equality. What are the opportunities and restraints here that you see particularly relate to the S S Security Council? The overall challenges of today, I think, have to do with um, uh, pushing back uh, populism, polarization, um, protectionism, mm. uh, arguing for multilateral solution, for peaceful solutions, uh, because we see also militarization that is going on very rapidly, where they seriously consider introducing more nuclear weapons, uh, as if that was uh, a, a solution to any, any problem. So I think this is for all of us to, uh, to consider and uh, also to continue to fight for democracy and human rights because this is also a, a tightening space for and shrinking space for, for human rights uh, defenders and, uh, and those who argue for democracy. So, so that's, that's the overall task yes, we are yeah. given at the moment. Yes. And would you see? And also I would say, fight for science and scientific yeah. uh, uh, evidence to to uh, as a base for the decisions that we make. And uh, this has been true for quite some time when it comes to climate change. But it is is more evident than ever that we have that challenge as well. Yes. And what would you say in regards to coalition building on? Like Sweden is taking the lead role here when it comes particularly framing feminist foreign policy, but what do you see as the opportunities of sort of building coalitions and mobilization on, on, on this platform? I have seen a huge interest uh, knowing more about what it is and how we work uh, with a feminist foreign policy. And I can see that countries like Canada and others are trying to follow and of course turn it into their own um, policy making processes. And um, and um, it's politically correct <laughs> today, but then we have to go behind and also make it a matter, of, to me it's also a matter of democracy. How can you ignore sort of consistently half the population, not let them in, not let them be represented? So to me it's not that much about sort of whether we are the one or the other sort of feminist, but, but really it's also a matter of, of democracy. and. And it's rational, it's uh, sound politics. Uh, and uh, that's why I try to, try to avoid this becoming a sort of ready set of, of uh, political views on everything or solutions. It's rather the approach. It's an analysis and it's the, uh, the approach and the instruments that you use. So that's why I turned it into sort of the three or the four R's that we have to use. And they, they work well, I have to say. They work as a, as a, a proper instrument uh, in, in everything we do still. Thank you. Uh, Professor Joshua Gerstein, I would like to probe a little bit about masculinity and focusing more also on peace negotiations. Uh, there's actually in the literature some arguments about the expression of hyper-masculinity that we can see in peace negotiations. How would you sort of unpack that rather abstract notion of hypermasculinity as being expressed in peace negotiations? And why I ask this question only to give the background is, and that will lead over to Tanya then later on, of how we can rethink peace diplomacy, rethink peace negotiations. So what are we seeing in the peace negotiations that are most of the time elite-based, and, and primarily conducted by men. So, 
and expressing some kind of hypermasculinity. What is your reading on, of this? Well, the, the, uh, the, the idea of having all men in a setting, it's not just that you're letting, out, letting off half the people who could be contributing. There's more to it than that because the all-male setting, that's traditionally the military kind of venue back through history and it's the male status hierarchy setting. So you're, you've got a lot of baggage on that, that room full of men that when you add women into the mix, um, it's not just diversity, but you're breaking up that picture, which I think is very important. So in the all-male um, status hierarchy forms of diplomacy, I think you're, you're leaning towards a more militarized view of diplomacy and you're leaning towards a more of a intermale competition um, and, and to the extent that we break that up and become more practical about what are the issues, what are the problems, um, not just for women, but uh, in general, what are the problems, and then you can address those in a more rounded way with a more diverse uh, participants. Interesting, and as I was saying, Tanya, that's leading over to the question <clears throat> to you as well, because there's some arguments saying that peace negotiations generally is structureless. It's not very structured. As you indicate, it's informal. It's building on informal networks, and influences are exercised in places, informal settings, as, for instance, secret negotiations. The question of transparency is not always there. So... One of the major issues, I think, when we think about rethinking uh, peace diplomacy, addressing gender justice in peace diplomacy, is how can we redesign then the peace negotiations from being structureless towards more structured, inclusive peace negotiations? You indicated some tools, but I know that you have actually outlined a few modalities, very precise ones, of how this can be done. Yeah, but I think uh, linking to what you just have said, it's also breaking this notion of there is this table with all the men and they are in power and they make all the decisions. It's not real. Anyway, as you said, there's a lot of sort of going on on the sidelines. And usually those who are sitting at the table are not the most powerful ones. The most powerful ones are the leaders back home. So often we even see this sort of break between those are there, but they might not even be the decision makers. So we have a lot of things, and I think the first thing is that a gender-based power analysis of understanding really what's going on, and then designing policies that open up and are more inclusive, especially, as you said, to break kind of the silo. What does this mean to be more inclusive? It means, I think, a holistic approach of both within delegations in the formal setting, and, simp and it's not enough to have a gender quota. You need to be also more young people. There's age that makes a huge difference. I've seen, like, I think uh, it was a long time ago in the Afghanistan negotiations, 2001, there was this one youth uh, activist, uh, female, and she made such a difference to really getting the people by, we are the youth, what are you doing to us? And you have these different expressions of people with different backgrounds from different constituencies. That's what the diversity is. It's really about diversity. That's inclusion. It's also not the right thing to see inclusion only as more women. Inclusion is really about the diversity and bringing everybody in. The democracy thing is, of course, having everybody also having the right to be there. Then it's, a, it's more or less a technical issue. There's very, diff very many options of how to do this, both with quotas, which work pretty well, actually, both with separate delegations, both with consultations that have real meaning and not are just sort of there to have the tick box. So it's really inclusion means a more inclusive set up of the talks, a process design that allows for this. I think that's, that's the most important thing. Yes. Can I just add, yes, absolutely. Can I just add one thing because we still we are still in a process of or in a situation where a hundred countries around the world have legislation that makes it uh, more difficult for women to enter into the labor market. Mm -hmm. And the World Bank did such a survey and uh, all the members of the World Bank uh, were looked at or surveyed for this and uh, for example, in Russia, there are 456 professions where women are not allowed uh, in, um, for example, to drive trains. Uh, 
but even in France, uh, there are a number of, uh, of uh, laws that, um, or there are a number of professions that women... So there, there is still so much, it's not just a matter of how we, you know, a gender approach from the point of view of, of fairness or democracy, but it's yeah. real yeah. discrimination that is still happening, including in, in Europe. And so it has to start with, with lots of these things to, to get rid of them uh, as well. And then, uh, then I think, yeah, well, I, I have lots of questions. Let, also let me to just add to <laughs> this, because I think we, what we found in our civil society in this broader research was really, it's not just about how these groups perform, how inclusive the setup is, but really also, like, as you said, how is the legal situation, how is this environment that allows it for things to happen? And then you have to kind of help this environment. So it's this, this holistic approach. But I would like to add something on these stereotypes, because this is an observation I have from the practical work I do, is that, for example, there's this, like, you cannot send a female ambassador or a female envoy to the Middle East. Oh, it's not possible, you know, in this male conversation. My experience is the contrary. It is like, male have a men have a particular, probably trained, as I'm not a gender expert, kind of way of how they behave with each other in a power way. They have a power game. If you send a male envoy, a male ambassador, he cannot help but be part of that game. If you send a woman, they're all like, what is this? There's nobody to play. Um, but there's somebody to respect, because this woman has a formal position, and we have to accept this formal position. So I see females in highly patriarchic societies much more easier uh, doing the job because you are out of this. First, the second thing is you have access. I mean, the first thing I do when I go on a mission, I go to the hairdresser. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but this is the most valid information you get. And you choose the hairdresser right. Do you want to talk to the elites? Do you want to talk to the grassroots? You choose the hairdresser. And then you know what is the conversation. I come back with a very different sort of set of intelligence gathering as compared to the others. So there is also something that is different. And I'm also a fan of acknowledging that there is a difference when I come into a setting and, and say I'm a mother in an African setting. Well, I have a very different standing. Mm. And of course, I'm a father means the same, but the society is not ready to accept that. But I find it very fair to play with these roles as long we are not all equal. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Yes, we can tackle the question of inclusion and exclusion from a variety of perspective. And I would also say that even though we are celebrating Lund University 350 years, we have to remember also that it took another more than 200 years before women could join uh, Lund University in the late 19th century. So we need to keep that in mind and to have that kind of historical perspective that also Anne provided us with. But I would like only to pick up and, uh, and if you could also maybe reflect a little bit more on this. We have talked about power and influence, positions and hierarchies, and I know that you have worked a lot on that. But are there, have you found in your work a correlation here? We saw that, for instance, on the Middle East, very few ambassadors. Are there reciprocation on part, for instance, that also countries that actually are doing quite well on gender equality in the foreign ministries tend or are not inclined to send a female ambassador to regions like Asia and the Middle East because they don't simply see it as a, a, a women-friendly diplomatic environment? Have mm -hmm. you seen any patterns of that Th in your work? There is some of that, yes. So the sending patterns or the receiving patterns are fairly similar, with the exception, I would say, of the United States. So the U.S. sends quite a few ambassadors and female, uh, female ambassadors and female diplomats, but they don't receive very many. Mm. And I think that, should, that tells us something, mm. right? That it's not, yes, the gender equality issue matters, but the power and prestige of the place matters as well, right? So I don't think that it's difficult for a woman to be effective in, in D.C. I mean, the U.S. is a place where women can work quite well. There are all kinds of women in professional positions, right? But, but there are not that many female ambassadors there, and that's an important thing. I, but I think it can be sometimes a bit misleading when you look at um, how to categorize the most powerful or militarily or economically uh, most powerful countries because I have to pay homage to my predecessor because uh, he actually appointed only women 
to the, uh, some of the uh, Eastern partnership countries and to Russia and to those countries that normally would not have uh, women ambassadors. And he did it consistently and really appointed women to this board. And they would not end up uh, on your sort of most powerful or most interesting list. But, but that was uh, a conscious move and a very, very good decision. And uh, today we, we don't hesitate to send women anywhere because they are, of course, bound, these countries are bound by conventions that regulate also the status of, of diplomats. But, mm -hmm. So it can be a bit misleading and it's changing ma ma material because, you know, after a couple of years they have to rotate so it can change very quickly also mm -hmm. how many female ambassadors we have, for example. And we've seen now that many choose to send women here because they know it's a good environment also for women in the Nordic countries, mm -hmm. uh, or they simply make it an experiment and to learn also from, from what we are doing. So it's a, um, yeah, it's a bit tricky uh, no, sometimes. And everything that we're looking at, I mean, it, like I said, I, I realize that we're not telling the full story, but, but, right, so there are countries that are doing a lot, like Sweden, but then there are countries also from the interviews we've done so far where I think they do take more consideration of is this a safe place for women, right? So sure. in Turkey, for instance, sure. we've talked to people at the ministry there and they do have a list of countries that they don't consider safe for female ambassadors, for instance, or female diplomats. So I think it varies a bit. But mm. if I could just add something also about the issue of stere gender stereotypes, I think there's something so interesting about di diplomacy and gender stereotypes because, you of course, you have a militarized masculinity which would seem to preclude women, right? Like we are not coded as beings that are aggressive and strong and all whatever, all the things you need to be. But di diplomacy, right, seems to be coded and all the ways they're typically female, right? It's about peace and speaking and listening and interactions, things that women are supposedly good at, right? It's about impeccable dress, Gossip is necessary, is central, right? Receptions and food and cookie trays, and uh, these are stereotypes, but still, if we're moving in the realm of stereotypes, I, that's a puzzle to me. I don't understand why diplomacy is not filled with women, because di diplomats or diplomacy is supposedly about the things that women are good at and what they do. So. But it's changing. Quickly. It is changing. I mean, it's changing fast. We don't have so much time, and Joshua, you, we will, I will allow everybody to respond uh, afterwards, but I would like also to invite actually the, the audience here, and I, we uh, will allow for three questions to be raised, and then the uh, great uh, uh, panel here will be able to respond. So uh, we have uh, one question there, and one here, and another one further down. So uh, if you raise your arm, the first one that I pointed at? Okay. And please uh, say your name and who you are. My name is Ana Maria Vargas, and I am the research director of the Swedish uh, Center for Local Democracy. And I have a question. <laughs> and the question uh, starts with a quote from The Guardian, and that is related to the country I come from, which is Colombia, which seems to be on the agenda of how peace is coming, and perhaps how the world is becoming a better place for Colombians. And the quote said, uh, from two weeks ago, Peace has proven more dangerous than war for activists and local leaders in Colombia because 110 leaders, local activists, have been murdered in the last year after the ceasefire. So, my question is, how does gender diplomacy, which for me seems like so elevated and close to like going to this fancy environment of, uh, I don't know, important people, links to these local leaders, to these local ambassadors that are fighting on the walk, the peace in countries like Colombia, and who are afraid of being murdered. Thank you. Thank you. And then we had one question here. I will take three of them in a row, and then we will be able to pick and choose in the panel which one you want to respond to. Um, my name is Mohammed from the Gaza Strip. I have a question to Minister Wallström. Um, by the end of 2015, you have became a popular icon in my country, both for the Palestinian Authority and even for Hamas people, when you addressed the futureless prospect facing and despairing the young people few months after Sweden recognized Palestine officially and advanced the diplomatic level or relations. 
Do, looking at the situation now, entire hopelessness, utter failure in the French initiative, the last hope to revive the situation or give it a push, what do you think could be a real breakthrough this situation? And being um, Sweden as the head of the Security Council in the United Nations, what could Sweden provide for the Palestinian people at the moment? Could it advance its um, political activities in the Palestinian occupied territories? And do you think there is a prospect ever to be to advance a feminist agenda in places like the Gaza Strip? Thank you very much. Thank you. And I had a one last question down there. So we get the microphone. There. Hi. Um, my name is Rahel from the Department of Political Science. Uh, for Joshua, you were uh, emphasizing the uh, male status hierarchy with militaries, and I believe this is not something uh, universal. Um, as you probably know, a lot of uh, women participated in various liberation uh, movements, uh, decolonization movements in uh, Africa, and we have some more uh, contemporary situations like women participating in the military in uh, Peshmerga, and as well as Yazidi women uh, par participating in violence uh, in terms of resistance. I'm afraid that um, you know when we uh, sort of stereotype we have these gender stereotypes of women being uh, peaceful and what have you, or being able to engage in diplomacy. We're forgetting that women are also agents of violence, and especially in the form of resistance. So my question is a bit general to all of you. How can a feminist foreign policy take into consideration women's right to resist and therefore be violent, especially if patriarchy um, only responds to violence? Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we can't uh, take any more questions, but as you see, we are opening up Pandora's box, lots of questions, and we could actually continue here for hours on uh, discussing these issues. But I will allow the, the panel here to, to respond. Uh, you got respond. some, yeah, and we make the other way around. So Anne, would you no, like to I'll, go out I'll first? I'll see I think the others are better at answering these questions. Okay, uh. thank you. So <laughs> Tanya. I think he, he had talked less because we were too yes. many women on the panel. <laughs> 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 let's, let's give the minority a chance. Well, uh, this question about women in uh, the history of combat is very good, and I have an entire talk about that history, um, which I would love to come back to Lund anytime, and, and we'll talk just about that. Um, and uh, well, everything you say is completely true. Um, women are uh, very good at fighting in, on those occasions when they've been drawn into combat, often in uh, guerrilla and militia situations, occasionally in state armies. Um, it leads me to something I wanted to tie in that we were talking about earlier, which is that uh, oftentimes women who break into a traditional male sphere, and specifically the military, are successful if they're good at what they do. And you find um, uh, a remarkable woman um, like Lozen with the Apaches, you know, she'd go out with the war parties and then uh, somebody would be asked, you know, do women ever go with the war parties? No, they don't. Well, what about Lozen? Oh, well, she could shoot, you know, she was good at that. So when women, and it's probably the same thing with the t diplomats, you know, if you go to the Middle East country, if you're good, if you're getting the job done, it's going to work. Um, and, and so um, there's a, a practicality aspect to this that I think is very important, that you don't always have to come straight on with the democracy and justice angle, but it's what you talked about being smart. You know, this is smart, you know. Um, we can do better, we can get better outcomes uh, by taking gender into account. Some of the most impressive work I've seen was the uh, Gender Force Project here in Sweden, Harlot Isaksson uh, in the Defense mm -hmm. Ministry and then at, at NATO, and it was so practical. It was like, you know, how do you better design a chemical warfare decontamination <coughs> tent if you think about gender. How do you build a bridge better? Uh, and so forth. So, and I had a, a marine captain here, uh, a man who was a gender advisor, tell me, if you want to talk to the military about gender, don't talk about justice and rights. Talk about operational effectiveness and force <coughs> protection. And then a few years later, I was talking with a, a big room of Norwegian military officers, almost all men, and, and they said, what's this thing about gender? This is a paraphrase, you know, what, that our political leaders want us to understand. And I said, oh, you need to understand gender so that when you get to Afghanistan, you don't get blown up. 
And they go, hmm, good idea. And then a guy at the back of the room said, I'm about to deploy to Afghanistan to a provincial reconstruction team, and there are no women on my, on my team. Do you think that's a problem, and, and should I add some women? And I said, hmm, good idea. You know, so just the practicality of it sometimes, um, again, breaks up the discourses that sometimes get so stuck. Maybe so. to add? Uh, yeah. To add on that, I think the, the, the problem we see also from research is not that their women are often underrepresented, especially in resistance struggle. The problem is what happens after the peace deal. And that's what we see now in most countries, that women are pushed back and they are not the ones that are integrated in the national army that is formed. They are not the ones that sort of getting the bigger jobs. So they are fighting, but then they are pushed back to sort of their normal role. and. This is, this is, I think, something that, that is already addressed in like what of gender sensitive uh, demobilization programs and the like. But it's still, the record is, is pretty low. Also, when you think how war changes gender roles, that you have more female headed households and then the men come back and everybody's confused about roles in this. And, there's oft, and then we have this typical increase statistically in much more uh, household and, and gender based violence after. The, the peace agreement. And that links to the question about what are sort of the, the, the local level uh, peace leaders. And I think there's, our research shows basically two things to it. One is there is much more consciousness at the moment in terms of the sort of high level diplomacy to integrate and include. At, le at least there's a lot of lip service about it. But then you see some countries, especially Colombia, as you know, there have been consultations during the FARC. Uh, uh, negotiations and with the ELN process, the second largest uh, armed group, there's uh, a lot of push towards more participation of different stratas of society. The question is how is that managed and how are the results of those sort of far away consultations being brought up sort of to, to the top? And this is a two way. So on the one hand, where we see that movements on the ground push for their inclusion and push for it, this is, of course, meeting then if there is a push from the top as well. So the two have to meet. But there's also other examples, and I think um, when you think about Lema Gama's movement in Liberia, they were the grassroots women that were then invited to come to the talks, and they said no, because they said, we're going to be co-opted. We don't want to be part. So sometimes it's also when, when, when we work with um, movements and civil society organizations, we have to really see like what is the best strategy with the best outcome because sometimes resistance and pushing outside of, for example, formal talks is equally important as being inside. But the other thing is, and that's the other research we have done, is that there's a lot of good things going on sometimes on the local level which can be sustained over time even if the official process breaks down. And sometimes there's even no need to link it all up because linking also always means co-optation. And we want to also safeguard and parallel these sort of positive developments on the ground. What happens often is how to sustain them when there is an official deal. Yes, thank you. Uh, Margot Wallström, Ma you had some specific questions here, no. and of course they are huge, so you can be selective. Uh, yeah, I think uh, there are two points to make about uh, women as uh, peacekeepers or women as, as fighters or um, soldiers. And uh, the first is that my starting point is that women should be allowed to choose. If they want to take on such a role, it, it should also be their, their choice to do so. Uh, and secondly, that's my starting point. Not that we are different from the beginning. I mean, most men have also had to be taught how to become a, a soldier. And we've, I have seen myself what happens also when men actually cannot fulfill the role that they are expected to play as warriors. Because uh, I saw it when it came to sexual violence in conflict, when, when they could not rape a woman, then they would uh, shoot her instead and, or do something else that uh, we should not even mention here at the moment. But uh, um, this, and, and women are also uh, warriors, but what they all say is they want to be seen as not only victims, but they want to be see, seen as agents of change in their own countries. They want to participate. And I think this is the most important thing. And of course, to do prevention as well, because this has to do with the role that women are given in a society. 
Everybody knows that they are also economic backbones of their society. They are the ones who, who uh, grow something and sell it. They carry produce to the market. They do all of that. Uh, but when the husband has been killed in a war, they are not allowed to inherit the land that they have been taking care of. So this is the whole, you have to have a whole a holistic view on, on these issues. Um, and I think maybe just to say one thing about Colombia, it's a long way still to mm -hmm. peace. And it's a very sensitive uh, situation right now where now, at this moment, uh, the FARC soldiers have come to the different camps, between 20 and, and 30 different camps all around um, Colombia, where they are handing over their weapons. So it's the, the demobilization, uh, disarmament uh, process that has started. They are very vulnerable when they left their guns, of course, uh, their weapons there. Uh, they are extremely vulnerable and uh, they expect also the promises that the government have given them to offer some alternative living uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be realized at this moment. And uh, still the violence against uh, all of those who fight for, for democracy and human rights and so on. And that, that has been an element uh, and a reality in, in Colombia for so long. And we still have to, to figure out how the international community can help to keep uh, people safe. And this has also been the most devastating effect. Um, uh, and, and especially, I must say, targeting women because they are very vulnerable in a situation like the one we've had in, and seen in Colombia for so long. And finally, uh, a word about Palestine and Gaza. In Gaza, it will not take long before the uh, drinking water um, they are out of drinking water. They can no longer fish uh, or in a very limited area uh, uh, in, outside the coast. Um, so they cannot actually create a living of, of their own. And the situation is also very, very uh, difficult. Um, and this can't go on. It has to change. And uh, we've asked, of course, for access to the project that we have paid for also in the Gaza Strip. Uh, very, very difficult to get the Israelis to accept that. But uh, the EU and, uh, and all the international community trying to assist and uh, to, to um, uh, change the situation in, in Gaza. With the Palestinians, we've also said that, you know, a person that is now 26 have only had a chance, one chance, to vote uh, if you're a Palestinian. You have to create a, a more democratic system involving young people. It's their future. Uh, and women. Um, so th this has to change also. And those are the reforms that the Palestinians themselves have to do. But also stop... Um, it's a fading vision, the two-state uh, solution right now. It's really um, just uh, uh, vanishing um, in front of our, our eyes at the moment um, with all the demolitions and the settlements uh, and, and all of those uh, things happening on the ground. So we, we can only continue to fight for, for a two-state solution because the alternative, nobody can see what is the alternative. And it will in any case mean probably more violence and and problems, and uh, that's why we, at least in the European Union and in the um, Security Council, argue for for uh, continue along the lines of a two-state solution. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, as you can hear and see and have heard today, uh, we I think this uh, panel has provided a fantastic inspirational agenda for students to engage on future studies to engage on politics and we are very honored and privileged that we know that the foreign minister Wallström has a very hectic uh, time schedule but it, you take the time to discuss and engage with uh, Lund University in such a way it's a great privilege but also for the ones who have traveled far to come here and to talk about your research and to have this very stimulating discussion so join me in a warm applaud to uh, the great speakers. <laughs>